All right, testing, testing, one, two, three. Let's see if I'm actually on. And it looks like it's working. Let me adjust my microphone a little bit. Hopefully that isn't too loud when I move it. All right, um, so before we begin the reading, um, if you were, if you had watched the problem set yesterday, you know there was a lot of problems uh, working through the problems. And I want to also, to test out a bit more of OBS, do a bit more specific derivations and do a, like clarify two problems specifically that are fairly emblematic of certain ways you have to approach problems in these textbooks. First, um, the first problem that there was big difficulty with was to prove that the nth root of a1, a2, all the way to an is less than or equal to 1 over n times the sum from k equals 1 to n a sub k. Um, and I had a lot of difficulty with this, and at one point I remarked, it seems like it depends what your AI are, and that actually ended up being correct. Um, this is something more with the textbook in case you're doing the problem set, like going over it yourself, that it's important to note. For example, let's take the third root case, and we take the third root of like... Actually, no, we don't even need to take the third root case. Well, actually, no, third root case would probably be best. So the third root of like negative one, negative one, zero. Well, this is just equal to the third root of zero is equal to zero. However, over here we have negative one minus one plus zero over three equals negative two over three which is strictly less than zero. Um, if we check the actual problems, if my interactive Google Chrome will work, give me a second to just get this working. It seems like, yeah, move it back to this part of the board. Um, yeah, up here it said, show that the nth root of a1, a2, all the way up to an is less than or equal to that. So we've seen that's strictly not true. Um, it is true in the cases that all your numbers are positive, or well, at least non-negative. Um, and that's something that you can prove on your own. But you need to be very aware that it actually does not hold for the case of including negative numbers. All right, so the other one was... Um, Oh, which one which one was it? It was a really good one. Uh not that. It was the one with the square free. Alright. You know what? Okay, screw it. We're just gonna we're just gonna restate the problem on the working board. Uh give me a second to get it all organized out. So we take this. It was that if G C D of X and Y equals 1 and x y equals n squared x equals m squared and y equals k squared um i tried to do this synthetically with an approach that used the gcd directly but that was that was unfortunate um <laughs> it doesn't work very well Instead, what we notice is that, first of all, we can just assume, we can assume that any negative ones in these factor out, so we can assume x and y are positive integers. Now x is going to be equal to p1, p2, all the way up to p sub x. Um, note here, I'll put x prime. x prime is just the number of primes in the factorization. Uh, y equals q1 q2 all the way up to q y prime um, with none of the primes in x being in y and none of the primes in y being in x 
So this means that xy equals p1, p2, all the way up to px prime, q1, q2, all the way up to qy prime. Well, note that because we have that xy equals n squared, we can let n equal Oh gosh, let's use let's use some horrible notation here. N equals C1, C2, all the way up to C N prime. This is its prime factorization here. Prime factorization. So N squared equals C1 squared C2 squared all the way up to c n prime squared. Now notice that if x y is equal to this, well then first of all, we have two cases for each of these primes, right? We have that c1, um, each c1 in this is contained in either x, uh, are both contained in x, are both contained in y, or one is contained in x and one is contained in y. However, what this means, notice, first of all, if C1 is in, or well, if C1 actually not, that shouldn't, that's not good in this case. If C1 divides X and C1 divides, no, oh gosh, that notation, divides Y, then GCD of X, Y, is greater than or equal to C1, a contradiction. Contradiction. So, we know that, I'll just, I'll just drag this over here for now. So we know that C1 uh, squared divides x or c1 squared divides y. However, we can apply this to every single c1, c2, all the way like there, so that we'll have x equals c i1 squared c i2 squared all the way up to c i like n prime, we'll just call it n prime. Actually, no. It will actually end up being, if you compute it, x prime. Uh, well, actually, let's just call it z1 squared. However, x will then be equal to ci1, ci2, all the way up to ci z1 squared. And likewise for y. So we're able to deduce from this that because the GCD of these two is um, equal to 1, that these are both actually perfect squares. All right, and if I remember correctly, that was all the problems that I wanted to clear up from the previous section. Um, so in short, both think about problems in very different ways, and excuse me. <coughs> Think about problems in different ways and make sure that you run a few examples of a problem of the problems especially a few weird examples just to make sure that like the problem does actually check out that the author isn't actually assuming anything but like under the hood of what you need to do to get, um, get the proof complete now now okay back to reading Chapter 3, Groups. We begin our study of algebraic structures by investigating sets associated with single operations that satisfy certain reasonable axioms. Note here, in this case, axioms is not like a thing we a priori supposed to exist, like a set theoretic axiom. It literally just means an axiom is something that describes the property, like a property that describes what we're studying. So like axioms basically weed out things that don't have that property. Um, that is, we want to define an operation on a set 
in a way that will generalize such familiar structures as the integer z together with the single operation of addition, or invertible 2x2 two two matrices together with the single operation of matrix multiplication. The integers in the 2x2 two two matrices, together with their respective single operations, are examples of algebraic structures known as groups. The theory of groups occupies a central position in mathematics. Modern group theory arose from an attempt to find the roots of a polynomial in terms of its coefficients. Groups now play essential roles in areas such as coding theory, counting, and the study of symmetries. Many areas of biology, chemistry, and physics all have benefited from group theory. 3.1. Integer equivalence, classes, and symmetries. Let us now investigate some mathematical structures that can be, that can be viewed as sets with single operations. 1. The integers mod n. The integers mod n have become indispensable in theory and applications of algebra. In mathematics, they are used in cryptography, coding theory, and the detection of errors in identification codes. We have already seen that two integers a and b are equivalent mod n if n divides a minus b. The integers mod n also partition z into n different equivalence classes. We will denote the set of these equivalence classes by z sub n. Note, I'll put a big fat note here. Z n has elements as equivalence classes. So we're not working, we're commonly going to express, for example, if we have the equivalence class 0, we will commonly just write that as 0. We will not be thinking about that in terms of the equivalence class, we'll commonly think about the elements within the equivalence class, because we'll show that they work in very nice ways. But it is important to note, it is very important to note that the, like, when we write this symbol, we mean the entire equivalence class when we work with the integers mod n. All right, back to the reading now. Consider the integers modulo 12 and the corresponding partitions of integers. First, the equivalence class of 0, which contains 0, 12, negative 12, 24, negative 24, on and on, while the equivalence class of 1 equals 1, uh, negative 11, 13, negative 25, I think? Or no, it would be negative 23, um, and 25, all the way up to the equivalence class of 11. Um, negative 1, 11, 23, 55, so on and so on. When no confusion can arise, we will use 0, 1, all the way up to 11 to indicate the equivalence classes of 0, 1, and up to 11. Note, once again, they are using the symbols to denote the equivalence classes. The symbols themselves are not the equivalence classes. They are just elements in it that describe the entire class. Because reminder from what we have earlier, a single element like uniquely determines its equivalence class under an equivalence relation. We can do arithmetic on z mod n. For two integers a and b, define addition modulo n to be a plus b mod n. That is, the remainder when a plus b is divided by n. Similarly, multiplication modulo n is defined as a times b mod n, the remainder when a b is divided by n. The following examples illustrate integer um, uh, arithmetic, uh, arithmetic modulo n. So I'm actually going to work through a few of these problems. So, 7 plus 4 is equivalent to 1 mod 5. Why is this true? Okay, so we first note that 7 plus 4 equals 11. 11 equals 2 times 5 plus 1. And since we're taking the remainder, we are simply setting this 1 to be equal to that over here. In a sense, you could say that, like, when you divide by, like, we take 7 plus 4, we have the number c such that when you subtract by c, this is actually divisible by 5. Two, three plus five is equivalent to zero mod eight. This is because 
3 plus 5 equals 8 equals 1 times 8 plus 0. Note here that because it divides, we have a remainder of 0. So that remainder is taken to be what we are qu uh, taking equivalent to mod 8. Three plus four is equivalent to seven mod twelve. Well, this is simply because three plus four equals seven equals zero times twelve plus seven. Because seven is actually less than twelve, we have a natural identification, and this will be for the case of all things. If two integers sum to something less, than what you're taking the modulus over, then it will just be that original thing it sums to, because it's going to be less than the modulus. Um, I won't write out the next three, but 7 times 3 is equivalent to 1 mod 5. Think about the fact that 7 times 3 equals 21. Uh, 21 equals 5 times 4 plus 1. 3 times 5 uh, is equivalent to 7 mod 8. 3 times 5 is equal to 15, is equal to 8 times 1 plus 7. And 3 times 4 is equivalent to 0 mod 12. 3 times 4 equals 12 equals 12, 1 times 12 plus 0. In particular, notice that it is possible that the product of two non-zero numbers, modulo n, can be equivalent to 0 modulo n. This is a big, a very big deal, but I'm not going to go over it anymore than the book is going over it now because it will just unveil itself as to how important that fact is over time. Example 3.2. Most, but not all, of the usual laws of arithmetic hold for addition and multiplication in Z mod n. For instance, it is not necessarily true that there is a multiplicative inverse. Consider the multiplication table for Z8 in figure 3.3. Notice that 2, 4, and 6 do not have multiplicative inverses. That is, for n equals 2, 4, and 6, then there is no integer k such as kn is a uh, k times n is congruent to 1 modulo 8. So 2, for example, we have 0, 2, 4, 6, 0, 2, 4, 6. For 4, we have 0, 4, 0, 4, 0, 4, 0, 4. And for 6, we have 0, 6, 4, 2, 0, 6, 4, 2. Note also, for anything else, um, I'm going to belabor a point that will probably not be very intuitive for a bit, but Consider, for example, 1, and notice that, first of all, 1 times 1 has a multiplicative inverse, so it's not special, but for everything else that has a multiplicative inverse, 3, you notice it goes 0, 3, 6, 1. For 5, 0, 5, 2, 7, 4, 1. 7, 0, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Notice that all these are co-prime to 8. All numbers that do not have a multiplicative inverse in this case are divisors of 8. Uh, which will be shown in full generality later, but I'm not going to, again, because this is a lot of preview of things to come, I'm not going to belabor that point too much. Proposition 3.4. Let z, uh, c sub n be the set of equivalence classes of the integers mod n, and a, b, c be elements of z sub n. 1. Addition and multiplication are commutative. That is, a plus b is congruent to b plus a mod n, and AB is congruent to BA mod n. 2. Addition and multiplication are associative. That is, A plus B plus C is congruent to A plus B plus C mod n. And AB times C is congruent to A times B times C mod n. 3. There are both additive and multiplicative identities. That is, there is an element 0 such that a plus 0 is congruent to a mod n, and there is an element 1, such that a times 1 is congruent to a mod n. 4. Multiplication distributes over addition. That is, a times b plus c is congruent to ab plus, b c, uh, plus ac mod n. 5. For every integer, there is an additive inverse negative a. That is, a plus negative a is congruent to 0 mod n. 6. Let a be a non-zero integer. Then gcd of a and n, remember, 
that we're taking um, z sub n is equal to 1 if and only if there exists a multiplicative inverse b for a mod n. That is, a non-zero integer b such that a b is equivalent to 1 mod n. Uh, for the proof, we will prove 1 and 6 and leave the remaining properties to be proven in the exercises. 1. Oh, okay, okay. It's just weird formatting with the book. 1. Addition and multiplication are commutative modulo n, since the remainder of a plus b divided by n is the same as the remainder of b plus a divided by n. This fundamentally comes out of the fact that a plus b is equal to b plus a in regular real number arithmetic. 6. Suppose that the greatest common divisor of a and n equals 1. Then there exist integers r and s, such that ar plus ns is equal to 1. Since ns is equal to 1 minus ar, it must be the case that ar is congruent to 1 mod, s, uh, mod n. Letting b be the equivalence class of r, ab is congruent to 1 mod n. Conversely, suppose that there exists an integer b such that ab is equivalent, uh, mod, uh, equivalent to 1 mod n. Since n divides ab minus 1, so uh, then n divides ab minus 1, so there is an integer k such that ab minus nk is equal to 1. Let d equal the greatest common divisor of a and n. Since d divides ab minus nk, d must also divide 1. Hence, d equals 1. Alright, uh, this right here is a preview. Um, we're going to also see that this kind of operation, like this kind of sense of operations that we've been having on the integers mod n, will also apply to symmetries of a rectangle. But for now, we're not going to worry about that. Uh, figure 3.5, the rigid motions of a rectangle. A symmetry of a geometric figure is a rearrangement of the figure preserving the arrangement of its sides and vertices as well as its distances and angles. A map from the plane to itself prever uh, preserving the symmetry of an object is called a rigid motion. For example, if we look at the rectangle in figure 3.5, let me scroll up so you can look at it. It is easy to see that a rotation of 180 degrees or 360 degrees returns a rectangle in the plane with the same orientation as the original rectangle and the same relationship among the vertices. A reflection of a rectangle across either the vertical axis or the horizontal axis can also be seen to be a symmetry. However, a 90 degree rotation in either direction cannot be a symmetry unless the rectangle is a square. So we have the identity symmetry. No, when we're talking about symmetries, the identity symmetry is always included. We have the 180 degree rotation of the rectangle, which takes it from A, B, C, D, calling the vertices out to C, D, A, B. We have a reflection across the vertical axis, where A, B, C, D goes to B, A, D, C. And we have a reflection across the horizontal axis, where A, B, C, D goes to D, C, B, A. Oh my gosh, okay. Let us, all right. Uh, this whole page above is the symmetries of a triangle. And I'm going to just, I'm just going to say, note that all the symmetries are written in permutation form. That is going to be useful for something, um, for a certain tool known as Cayley tables later. But for now, you don't need to worry too much about it. Let us find the symmetries of the equilateral triangle, delta ABC. To find a symmetry of the uh, triangle with, si um, with points a, b, c, or vertices a, b, c, we must first examine the permutations of the vertices a, b, and c, and then ask if a permutation extends to a symmetry of the triangle. Recall that a permutation of a set, s, is a 1 to 1 and on to, uh, we will call that a bijective, map pi from s to s. The three vertices have three um, factorial, or six permutations. So the triangle has, at most, six symmetries. To see that there are six permutations, observe that, the, um, that uh, there, are three there, are, there are three different possibilities for the first vertex and two for the second, and the remaining vertex is determined by the placement of the first two. So we have three times two times one equals three factorial equals six different arrangements. To denote the permutations of the vertices of an equilateral triangle that sends A to B, B to C, and C to A, we write the array a, b, c, b, c, a. 
this should be read downwards, that A is sent to B, B is sent to C, C is sent to A. Notice that this particular permutation, actually, I'll actually, I'll write this down, I'll write this down. So, A, B, A, B, B, C, C, A, means A is sent to B, B is sent to C, C is sent to A. So we have a kind of implied thing right here with how we're supposed to read the notation. Notice that this particular permutation corresponds to the rigid motion, the A, B, B, uh, the A, B, C, B, C, A um, permutation corresponds to the rigid motion of rotating the triangle uh, by 120 degrees in a clockwise direction. In fact, every permutation gives rise to a symmetry of the triangle. All these symmetries are shown in figure 3.6. So going back here, first, if we just have the permutation which sends everything to itself, it sends A, um, it sends A to A, uh, to A, it sends B to B, it sends C to C. That is itself an I, um, a symmetry, just an identity symmetry, a very boring symmetry. So it sends A to B C to A B C. Then our first permutation, A is sent to B, B is sent to C, C is sent to C, uh, C is sent to A, is corresponds to rotating this uh, triangle 90 degrees. So A is sent up top, B is sent to the lower right, C is sent to the lower left. Next, we have A is sent to C, B is sent to A, C is sent to B, which is just a rotation in the other direction. A is sent from the lower left to the lower right, B is sent to the top to the lower left, and C is sent to the lower right to the top. Then we have a reflection, A, um, A B, C is sent to A, C, B, uh, which keeps A um, fixed in place but it reflects around the line through the center of A. So like for example, A, B, C, we can draw a line that passes through it and we just flip the triangle to the other side. To get A, B, C, goes to A, C, B. Um, the next reflection is a reflection around B and the final reflection is a ref uh, reflection around C. A natural question to ask is what happens if one motion of the triangle, delta ABC, is followed by another? Which symmetry is, in this case, mu1, p1? mu1 being the reflection around the line going through A, and p1 being the reflection that just rotates it, not like rotates it palm 2 pi over 3 degrees to the right. Uh, that is what happens when we do the permutation p1, then another permutation p2. Remember that we are composing functions here. Although we are usually multi uh, we usually multiply left to right, we compose functions from right to left. So mu1 p1 of a equals mu1 p1 of a equals mu1 of b equals c. Mu1 p1 of b equals mu1 p1 of b equals mu1 of c equals b. And mu1 p1 of c equals mu1 p1 of c equals mu1 of a equals a. This symmetry is the same as mu2, which is just the reflection around b. Um, suppose we do these motions in the opposite order, p1, then u1. It is easy to determine that this is the same symmetry as mu3, rotating around the line through the c. Therefore, we have a non-commutative way of composing functions here. We have mu1, p, uh, p1, mu1 is not equal to mu1 p1. A multiplication table for the symmetries of an equilateral triangle, ABC, is given in figure 3.7. Notice that in the multiplication table for the symmetries of an equilateral triangle, for every motion of the triangle A, there is another motion B, such that AB is equal to the identity. That is, for every motion, there is another motion that takes a triangle back to its original orientation. So, like, let's look for that specifically. We first have ID. Obviously, it sends ID to ID if you just compose it with ID. For P1, if you compose it with P2, 
it sent to ID. For P2, you send it, uh, you compose it with P1 is equal to ID. For mu1, uh, you compose it with mu1. You compose it with itself in this case to get ID. And the same for mu2 and mu3. As well, note for a fair number of these. Uh, if we have like mu1, p1 here, and p1, mu1 here, we also show, um, show more of that non commutative behavior. It sends it to different permutations. All right, now we're going to get into the full general definition of a group abstractly. <sighs> Section 3.2 Definitions and Examples. The integers mod n and the symmetries of a triangle or a rectangle are examples of what mathematicians call groups. First, a binary operation or law of composition on a set G, just a regular set, is a function G times G to G that assigns to each pair A, B in G times G a unique element that we may denote A composed with B or A times B in G called the composition of A and B. A group G comp um, composition is a set G together with a law of composition A B is sent to A composed with B that satisfies the following axioms. First, the law of composition. Actually, I'm going to write this out. The full definition here, because this definition underlies everything we do in group theory. So we have. G and a, a function called composition, G times G to G, that satisfies one. If I remember, the first uh, the law of composition is associative. We have A composed with B composed with C equals A composed with B composed with C. And notice here. With how we define this, we only take two inputs at a time. We have to specify this larger structure on three or more inputs. Two. For every, uh, there exists an element E in G. So we'll call it E. And we'll say that we we'll put the existence symbol. There exists an E in G such that for any A in G, we have that A composed with E equals E composed with A equals A. Note in this case that we require it both be, ident uh, be an identity from the left and from the right, which rules out certain pathological examples in very weird groups that you would get into, or very weird, uh, very weird like almost pseudo groups. Finally, for um, every element, for all A in G, there exists an element, let's call it A to the negative 1 in G, such that A composed with A to the negative 1 equals A to the negative 1 composed with A equals our identity element G. A prom, a group G, which once again is a set along with a binary operation that satisfies these axioms with the property that A composed with B equals B composed with A for all A and B and G is called abelian or commutative. Note here, I will I will stress this again, that not all groups in our definitions, we didn't require that groups be commutative. We simply required that they be associative, have identity, and have inverse. Commutativity is an extra layer of structure on top of what we already have. Groups not satisfying this property are said to be non-abelian or non-commutative. So. Most likely we're going to go through a bunch of examples, and this is very good because there is a lot here to cover. First, example 3.8. The integer z, which is just negative uh, 0, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, on and on, form a group under the operation of addition. The binary operation on two integers m, n, and z is just their sum. So in this case, 
m composed with n is just n plus n. Notice here, when we write the composition symbol, the composition symbol is just a notation. Like, composition could be written as times, could be written as x, could be written as plus. It's all the same thing. It's just how we label this operation up here, and usually the context in, what, uh, in which what we're working with. Uh, example here, yeah, example three point eight. Yep. Yeah. Uh, since the integers under addition already have a well-established notation, we will use the operator plus instead of comp uh, composition. That is, we shall write m plus n instead of m composed with n. We have an identity being equal to zero, and the inverse of n in the integers is written as negative n instead of n to the negative one. Notice that the set of integers under addition have the additional property that m plus n equals n plus m, and therefore forms an abelian group. Most of the time we will write a times b instead of a composed with b. However, if the group already has a natural operation, such as addition of the integers, we will use that operation. That is, if we are adding two integers, we shall write m plus n, negative n for the inverse, and zero for the identity as usual. We also write m minus n instead of m plus negative n. It is often convenient to describe a group in terms of addition or multiplication table. Such a table is called a Cayley table. Example 3.9. The integers mod n form a group under addition modulo n. Note here that integers mod n refer to the equivalence classes of integers mod n. Consider z sub 5, or z5 consisting of the equivalence classes of the integers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. We define the group operation on Z5 by modular addition. We write the binary operation on the group additively. That is, we write n plus n. The element 0 is the identity of the group, and each element in Z5 has an inverse. For instance, 2 plus 3 equals 3 plus 2 equals 0. Figure 3.10 is a Cayley table for Z5. By proposition 3.4, Z sub n equals 0, 1, all the way up to n minus 1, is a group under the binary operation of addition mod n. So first of all, we're going to go back to this, we're going to go back to proposition 3.4 for a second so we can see properly, but first, just examining the Cayley table for Z5, we have one, um, it basically is regular addition until you hit 5 and then you wrap around. That's how you can commonly think about this. Uh, there's a lot of online resources that talk about things like cl um, clock arithmetic as another way of visualizing it. But for this, this should be good enough. Now, going back to Proposition 3.4, note that first, we showed that the operation was commutative, we showed that it's associative, we showed that there are ad like additive and multiplicative identities. For the multiplication identities, we don't worry about that too much right now. We just worry about the additive identities. Um, the distribution, don't worry about that right now. For every integer a, there is an additive inverse, negative a. And like those like parts 5, 2, and 3 are the actual things that turn this into a group. All right, so going on. Example 3.11. Alright, here's a big thing. Not every set with a binary operation is a group. For example, if we let modular multiplication be the, uh, be the binary operation on Zn, so we're changing that plus to be a times in this case, then Zn fails to be a group. The element 1 acts as a group identity, since 1 times k equals k times 1 equals k for any k in uh, Zn. However, a multiplicative inverse for 0 never exists since 0 times k equals k times 0 equals 0 for every k in Zn. And since it's always going to be 0, there's never going to be an element such that it's equal to 1. Even if we consider the set z sub n set minus 0, we may still not have a group. For instance, let 2 be in z sub 6. Then 2 has no multiplicative inverse, since 0 times 2 is equal to 0, 2 times 2 is equal to 4, 4 times 2 equals equal to 2, 1 times 2 is equal to 2, 3 times 2 is equal to 0, and 5 times 2 equal to 4. For none of these, all of these equals something other than 1, which is what we're looking for. 
by proposition 3.4, every non-zero k does not have an inverse if z, uh, z sub n, if k is, uh, every non-zero k does actually have an inverse in z sub n, if k is relatively prime to n. Denote the set of all such non-zero elements in Zn by u of n. The u of n is a group called the group of units of z sub n. Figure 3.12 is a Cayley table for the group u8. So note, in u8, 0, 2, 4, and 6 all are non-units. They all don't have a multiplicative inverse, so they're not included in this. However, 1, 3, 5, and 7 do. And then we'll see here, for example, like, for it's 1 times 1, 3 times 3, 5 times 5, and 7 times 7. Example 3.13. The symmetries of an equilateral triangle described in section 3.1 form a non-abelian group. As we observed, it is not necessarily true that AB is equal to BA for two symmetries A and B. Using figure 3.7, which is a Cayley table for this group, we can easily check that the symmetries of an equilateral triangle are indeed a group. We will denote this group by either S3 or D3, for reasons that will be explained later. Ah uh, yeah, because it's going to be elaborated on later, I'm not going to like expand on that definition now. I'm not going to try to make it like a definition you memorize now, because once we get to rigid like symmetries of shapes generally, then that will be explained. Now, example 3.14. We will use m sub 2 of r to denote the set of all 2 by 2 matrices. This is kind of a lie. Um, m2 of r denotes the set of all 2 by 2 matrices with real valued entries. Um, so for example, m2 of c would be the set of all like 2 by 2 matrices with like complex entries. Um, let gl2 of r be the subset of m2 of r consisting of invertible matrices. That is, a matrix A equals A, B, C, D is in GL2 of R if there exists a matrix A to the negative 1, such that A, A to the negative 1 equals A to the negative 1, A equals I, where I is the 2 by 2 identity matrix. For A, to have an inverse is equivalent to requiring the determinant of A to be non-zero. That is, determinant of A is equal to AD minus BC is not equal to zero. The set of invertible matrices form a group called the general linear group. The identity of the group is the identity matrix I equals 1, 0, 0, 1. And the inverse of A in GL2 of R is A to the negative 1 equals 1 over AD minus BC, all times D negative B negative C A. The product, note in here that the matrices that we're, uh, we're talking about, our composition law is a product of matrices which if you're thinking linear transformations is literally actually just the composition of the functions they represent, the transformations. The product of two invertible matrices is again invertible. Matrix multiplication is associative, satisfying the other group axiom. For matrices, it is not true in general that AB is equal to BA. Hence, GL2 of R is another example of a non-abelian group. So, for example, Oh, this is going to be a fun, this is going to be a fun group. Example 3.15. Let 1 equal, like, now we're, now we're going to let letters denote matrices in this. Let 1 be the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. Let i be equal to the matrix 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Let j equal 0, i, i, 0, the imaginary number i. And let k be equal to i, 0, 0, negative i, where i squared is equal to negative 1. Then we have the relations i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals negative 1, ij equals k, jk equals i, and ki equals j. ji is equal to negative k, kj equals negative i, and ik equals negative j hold. The set q sub 8 equals plus minus 1 plus minus i plus minus j plus minus k is then a group called the quaternion group. Notice that q8 is non commutative. So for example, jk equals i and kj equal, um, let me actually highlight it, jk equals i and kj equals negative i. Example 3.16.
let C star be the set of non-zero, non-zero note here, complex numbers. Under the operation of multiplication, C star forms a group. The identity is 1. If Z is equal to A plus BI is a non-zero complex number, then we have a multiplicative inverse by simply applying a regular like formula to get z to the negative 1 equals a minus bi over a squared plus b squared, um, which is the inverse of z. It is easy to see that the remaining group axioms hold. A group is finite, or has finite order, if it contains a finite number of elements. So when we're talking about a group being finite, we mean, let me go back to the whiteboard here, this group, the set here that we're taking an operation over is finite. Um, the group is said to be infinite or to have infinite order if it does not have a finite number of elements, the set that we're taking the group over. The order of a finite group is the number of elements that it contains. If G is a group containing L, uh, N elements, we write the, uh, we write that of G. Oh gosh, give me a second. If G is a group containing N elements, we write bar g bar is equal to n, which I'll just refer to as the order of g for now on. The group of z5 is a finite group of order 5. The integer z form an infinite group under additions, and we sometimes write that the order of z equals infinity. Basic propositions, uh, basic properties of groups. Okay, wait, before I continue reading, give me a second to grab some water. All right, should be good. Proposition 3.17. The identity element in a group G is unique. That is, there exists only one element, E and G, such that E G equals G E equals G for all G and G. Note here that when we're talking about this, we already assume the existence of an identity element. That part's not in question. We're talking about the uniqueness. So what we're going to show is that if E and E prime are both identities, then they're actually equal to each other. And because all identity elements are equal, then, well, there's only one identity element. Proof. Suppose that E and E prime are both identities in G. Then E G equals G E equals G. And E prime G equals G uh, E prime equals G for all G and G. We need to show that E equals E prime. If we think of E as the identity, then E E prime equals E prime. But if E prime is the identity, then E E prime equals E. Combining these two equations, we have E equals E E prime equals E prime. Inverses in a group are also unique. If G prime and G prime prime are both inverses of an element G in a group G, then G G prime equals G prime G equals E, and G G prime prime equals G prime prime G equals E. We want to show that g prime equals g prime prime, but g prime equals g prime e equals g prime g g prime prime equals g prime g g prime prime equals e g prime prime equals g prime prime. We summarize this fact in the following proposition. Okay, before we actually go to this, note something here. First, we have g prime, then we have the axiom of the identity element. We take that. Then from there, because of the definition of the inverse, we can replace e with g g prime prime. Now here's the big like one of the big things. This is where associativity is such an important thing, because if we don't have associativity, we can't do anything else. But because we know we have associativity, we can move the brackets from being here to being here. G prime g equals g prime prime. Then we just show this is the identity, and have that, and we have a valid string of equalities that show that the two inverses are actually equal in your group. We summarize this fact in the following proposition. Proposition 3.18. If G is any element in a group G, then the inverse of G, denoted by G to the negative one, is unique. Proposition 3.19. Let G be a group. If A, B is in G, then AB to the negative one equals B to the negative one, A to the negative one. Notice that we've actually flipped the order of things here. So, proof. Let A and B in G. Then A, B, A, B, take that as like, think about bracketing that, to, uh, B to the negative one, A to the negative one. Well, we first have that we can re-bracket it to, actually, okay. 
a part of me is kind of mixed on how they're writing things out here. So, let me write it out. Okay. So, a, b, b to the negative 1, a to the negative 1. Then we can re-bracket as a, b, b to the negative 1, a to the negative 1. Then, by definition of the identity, is equal to a, e, a to the negative 1, equals a, a to the negative 1, equals e. Which is actually a valid string of equalities showing that this element is an inverse. This element is an inverse of this element. And note that by, well, since previous propositions said that inverses are unique, then this actually completely determines the inverse of two elements in a group. Proposition 3.20. Let G be a group. Then, for any A in uh, G, A to the negative 1 to the negative 1 is equal to A. Proof. Suppose that, uh, oh no, observe that A to the negative 1 a to the negative one to the negative one is equal to e. It's a bit of a mouthful, but if you let um, if you just let b be equal to a to the negative one, it's literally just the phrase that b times b to the negative one is the identity. There's just an extra negative one floating in there, making it look complicated. Consequently, multiplying both sides of the equation by a, we have a to the negative one to the negative one equals e times a to the negative one to the negative one equals a times a to the negative 1 times a to the negative 1 to the negative 1 equals a times e equals a. It makes sense to write equations with group elements and group operations. If a and b are two elements in a group g, does there exist an element x and g such that ax is equal to b? If such an, a, uh, such an x uh, does exist, is it unique? The following proposition answers both of these questions positively. Proposition 3.21. This is actually one of the biggest motivators behind a lot of this. Basically, what structure do we need to have on a set that we can solve basic linear equations? Um, and this answers both that we need a group structure. Proposition 3.21. Let G be a group and A and B be any two elements in G. Then the equations AX equals B and XA equal B have unique solutions in G. Proof. Suppose that ax equals b. We must show that such an x exists. We can multiply both sides of the equation ax equals b by a to the negative n to find x equals ex equals a to the negative 1 ax equals a to the negative 1 b. To show uniqueness, suppose that x1 and x2 are both solutions of ax equals b. Then ax1 equals b equals ax2. So x1 equals a to the negative 1a x1 equals a to the negative 1a x2 equals x2. The proof for the existence and uniqueness of the solution of xa equals b is similar. Proposition 3.22. If g is a group and a, b, and c are in g, then ba equals ca implies that b equals c and AB equals AC implies that B equals C. This proposition tells us that the uh, right and left cancellation laws are true in, group, uh, in groups. We leave the proof as exercise. Okay. We can use the exponential notation for groups just as we do in ordinary algebra. If G is a group and G is in G, first, we define G to the zero is equal to E. This is one of the reasons that anything to the zero is equal to one. It's a nice construct we'll find out. Um, and it's just the general group theoretic version of that. For n and n, we define g to the n to be g composed with g composed with g on n times total, and g to the negative 1 to be equal to g to the negative 1 times g to the negative 1 all the way times g to the negative 1 composed with itself n times. Now, theorem 3.23. In a group, the usual laws of exponents hold. That is, for all g and h in g, 1. g to the m times g to the n equals g to the m plus n for all m and n in z. 2. g to the m all to the n equals g to the mn for all m and n in z. And 3. g times h to the n equals h to the negative 1 g to the negative 1 to the negative n for all n in z. 
Furthermore, note here something important. If g is abelian, and we must have that g is abelian, then g times h to the n equals g to the n h to the n. We will leave the proof of this theorem as an exercise. Notice that g h to the n is not equal to g to the n h to the n in general, since the group may not be abelian. If the group is z or zn, we write the group operation additively and the exponential operation multiplicatively. That is, we write n times g instead of g to the n. The laws of exponents now become mg plus ng equals m plus n times g for all m and n, uh, m times ng equals mn times g, m uh, and m plus g plus m times g plus h equals mg plus mh for all n and z. It is important to realize that the last statement can only be made because z and zn are commutative groups. Historical note. Although the first clear axiomatic definition of a group was not given until the late 1800s, group theoretic methods have been employed before this time in the development of many areas of mathematics, including geometry and the theory of algebraic equations. Joseph Louis Lagrange used group theoretic methods in 1770 to 1771 memoir to study the methods of solving polynomial equations. Later, Evary Scawa, um, born 1811 to 1832, succeeded in developing the mathematics necessary to, de um, to determine exactly which polynomial equations could be solved in terms of the coefficients of the polynomial. Galois's primary tool was group theory. The study of group uh, geometry was revolutionized in, seven, uh, in 1872, my apologies, when Felix Klein proposed that geometric spaces should be studied by examining those properties that are invariant under a transformation of the space. Sophus Lee, a contemporary of Klein, used group theory to study solutions of partial differential equations. One of the first modern treatments of group theory appeared in William Bernstein's The Theory of Groups of Finite Order, 1, first published in 1897. Okay, so we're actually doing a fair amount of this. Right. Before we continue, I'm going to grab myself a drink because that was a lot of reading. Alright, 3.3, subgroups, definitions and examples. Sometimes we wish to investigate smaller groups sitting inside of a larger group. The set of even integers 2 times z, which is equal to 0, 2, negative 2, 4, negative 4, on and on, is a group under the operation of addition. Uh, this smaller group sits naturally inside of the group of integers under addition. And this is fundamentally because 2 times an integer plus 2 times an integer is 2 times another integer. And the uh, 2 times 2 has a mul uh, an additive inverse, so 0 is included in the group, and things of the sort. We define a subgroup H of a group G to be a subset H of G, such that when the group operation of G is restricted to H, H is a group in its, all right, uh, in its own right. So... Note that our four previous axioms, or well, the three previous axioms, along with the definition that the composition is a function from h to h, is a proper group, um, is required to make h a subgroup. Observe that every group G with at least two elements will always have at least two subgroups, the subgroup of consisting of the identity element alone and the entire group itself. The subgroup h equals e of a group g is called the trivial subgroup. A subgroup that is a proper subset of g is called a proper subgroup. And many of the examples that we have, uh, that we have investigated up to this point, there exist other subgroups besides the trivial and improper subgroups. Example 3.24. Consider the set of non-zero real numbers r star with the group operation of just multiplication. The identity of this group is 1, and the inverse of any element a in r star is just 1 over a. And note, because the real numbers um, we have 0 not equal to it, 1 over a is always defined. We will show that q star equals p over q, with p and q are non-zero integers, non-zero being the important word here, is a subgroup of r star. The identity of r star is 1. However, 
1 is equal to 1 over 1 is the quotient of two non-zero integers. Hence, the identity of r star is in q star. Now, given two elements in q star, say p over q and r over s, their product pq over qs, pr over qs, is also in q star. The inverse of any element p over q in q star is again in q star, since p over q to the negative 1 is simply equal to q over p. Since multiplication in r star is already associative, multiplication in q star is associative. It's important to note that we already get a lot of structure when we have a group in the first place. Commonly, we don't have to show things like associativity because we already know associativity holds in the larger group. So if we're looking at a smaller group, there's no way associativity can fail. Example 3.25. Recall that C star is the multiplicative group of non-zero complex numbers. Let h be equal to 1, negative 1, i, and negative i. Then h is a subgroup of C star. It is quite easy to verify that h is a group under multiplication, and that h is a subset of C star. So for example, what it's corresponding to in that case, we'll see eventually it's corresponding to a certain like rigid symmetries of a square, but even just like, a lot of it is like, for example, the main thing that we have to worry about here is first of all, every element has a inverse in this. So for example, the inverse of i is negative i. The inverse of negative one is negative one. Um, the inverse of negative i is i. And if we take any two elements in h and multiply them together, we get another element in h. And along with that, we have the identity element one. That is the big things for a subgroup to have. Example 3.26. Let SL2 of r be the subset of GL2 of r consisting of matrices of determinant 1. That is, a matrix A, which is equal to A, B, C, D, is in SL2 of R exactly when A, D minus B, C is equal to 1. To show that SL2 R is a subgroup of the general linear group, we must show that it is a group under matrix multiplication. The 2 by 2 identity matrix is in SL2 of R, as is the inverse of a matrix A which in general form is a to the negative 1 equals d negative b negative c a. And notice that because it's indeterminate, like, it has determinant 1, the coefficient in front of it is just 1 over 1 is equal to 1, so we just have to worry about rearranging the entries in the matrix. It remains to show that matri uh, multiplication is closed. That is, that the product of two matrices of a determinant also has determinant 1. We will leave this task as an exercise. The group SL2 of R is called the special linear group, possibly with entries in R. But generally, when we're talking about the special linear group, it will be clear from context whether we're talking about the real numbers or the complex numbers. Example 3.27. It is important to realize that a subset H of a group G can be a group without being a subgroup of G. For H to be a subgroup of G, it must inherit the binary operation of G. The set of all 2 by 2 matrices, M2 of R, forms a group under the operation of addition. The 2 by 2 general linear group is a subset of M2R and is a group under matrix multiplication, but it is not a subgroup of M2 of R. If we add two invertible matrices, we do not necessarily obtain another invertible matrix. Observe that 1001 plus negative 100 negative 1 is equal to 0000, zero, zero, zero. but the zero matrix is not in GL2 of R. Example 3.28. One way of telling whether or not two groups are the same is by examining their subgroups. Other than the trivial group and the group itself, the group Z4 has a single subgroup consisting of the elements 0 and 2. From the group Z2, we can form another group of four elements as follows. As a uh, set, this group is Z2 times Z2. We perform the group operation co um, coordinate-wise. That is, A plus B, uh, AB plus CD is equal to a plus c, b plus d. I'm just going to note here that this is going to be a very important construction, I'm just going to leave it at that for now so I don't get into a category theoretic grant. Figure 3.29 is an additional uh, addition table for z2 times z2. Since there are three non-trivial proper subgroups of z2 times z2, with our subgroups being h1 being 0, 0, 0, 1, h2 being 0, 0, 1, 0, and h3 equals 0, 0, 1, 1, Z4 and Z2 times 2 must be different groups. 
if you don't really understand why that is the case, notice that if these are the same groups, they should have the same subgroups, right? Like, it would feel weird for two groups, like a subgroup in one should correspond directly to a subgroup in the other if they are fundamentally the same thing. But in this case, they are not. Um, in later terminology, we're going to say that these two subgroups are not isomorphic, but for now, just think of them as being fundamentally different in some way. Some subgroups theorems. Let us examine some criteria for determining exactly when a subset of a group is a subgroup. Proposition 3.30. A subset H of a group G is a subgroup if and only if it satisfies the following conditions. First, the identity E of G is an H. Two, if H1 and H2 is an H, then H1 times H2 is an H. And three, if H is an H, then H to the negative one is an H. Proof. First, suppose that H is a subgroup of G. We must show that the three conditions hold. Since H is a group, we must have an identity, E sub H. We must show that E sub H equals E, where E is the identity of G. We know that E sub H, E uh, times E sub H equals E sub H, and that E times E sub H equals E sub H equals E equals E sub H. Hence, E E sub H equals E sub H E sub H. By right hand cancellation, E equals E sub H. The second condition holds since a subgroup H is a group. To prove the third condition, let H and H. Since H is a group, there is an element H prime and H such that H H prime equals H prime H equals E. By the uniqueness of the inverse in G, H prime equals H to the negative one. Conversely, if the three conditions hold, we must show that H is a group under the same operations as G. However, these conditions plus the associativity of the binary operation are exactly already the axiom stated in the definition of a group. Proposition 3.31 Let H be a subset of a group G. Then H is a subgroup of G if and only if H is not equal to the empty set. And whenever G of M and H are an H, then G H to the negative 1 is an H. Proof. First assume that H is a subgroup of G. We wish to show that G H is the negative 1 and H whenever G and H are an H. Since H is an H, its inverse H to the negative 1 must also be an H. Because of the closure of the group operation, G H to the negative 1 is an H. Conversely, suppose that H as a subset of G, H is a subset of G such that H is not equal to the empty set and G H to the negative 1 and H whenever G H and uh, H are an H. If G is an H, then G, um, G times G to the negative 1 equals E is an H. If G is an H, then E G to the negative 1 equals G to the negative 1 is also an H. Now, let H1, H2, and H. We must show that their product is also an H. However, H1 times H2 to the negative 1 to the negative 1 equals H1, H2 is an H. Hence, H is a subgroup of G. Um, all right, we're not going to ignore this stage. I'm going to read out the reading questions. I'm going to take a short intermission to catch my voice. All right, reading questions. In the group Z sub eight, compute six plus seven and two to the negative one. So again, so it's Z sub eight, it looks like. Yeah. Six plus seven is equal to 13 is equal to 8 times 1 plus 5 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 I think I'm pretty sure I hope I don't make a fool out of myself so 6 plus 7 is equal to 5 well I should say congruent to 5 mod 8 2. In the group U16, oh, I okay, wait, also, uh, in sub 8, we have to have some element 2 to the negative 1 is the element such that 2 plus 2 to the negative 1 is congruent to 0 mod 8, which would mean that 2 plus 2 to the negative 1 is equal to k times 8. So 2 to the negative 1 equals k 
times eight minus two, let k equal one, then two to the negative one equals eight minus two equals six. So we can also easily see two plus six is congruent to zero mod eight. All right, next reading question. Uh, in the group US 16, compute five times seven and three, um, three to the negative one. So we're looking for five times seven is congruent, um, is equal to, let me bust out my calculator again because I'm very bad with basic arithmetic. Um, five times seven is equal to 35. We subtract by 16. 19 16 equals equals 2 times 16 plus 3 so is equal to 3 so 5 times 7 is congruent to 3 mod 16 as well so for this we have 3 times negative 1 is the number such that 3 times 3 to the negative 1 is congruent to 0 mod 16 it was? Let me double check. Yeah, so 3 times 3 to the negative 1 equals k times 16. So we divide it by 3 to the negative 1 is equal to k over 3 times 16. So we just let k over th Oh wait, oh, I think I'm doing this wrong. No, yeah, I'm doing this wrong, I'm doing this wrong. Let's do this computationally. So we need... Oh, that's why I'm doing it wrong. I'm, I, I, was a bit, I was a bit dumb. Don't, don't be dumb like me. Because we're working with... In this case, because we're working in U16, we'll be fine to find the one that so our subset is equal to 1. So we want to find the number such that 3 times 3 to the negative 1 minus 1 is come equal to k times 16. So we have, in this case, would be a nice, what would be a nice way to do this? All right, let, let me think a bit harder about this as like a general method to compute, because you could just brute force it at this point, but I'm trying to be a bit clever. Actually, what if I just do 3 times 3 to the negative 1 equals k times 16 plus 1. So 3 to the negative 1 is equal to k times 16 plus 1 over 3. So first we note that 16, uh, 1 times 16 is equal to 16 not divisible by 3. 2 times 16 equals... Oh yeah. Let me... We're basically going to be trying to now... Okay, now that we have this, we're going to be searching for the smallest value of k, such that k times 16 plus 1 is divisible by 3, which should give us an actual nice value uh, for 3 to negative 1. So... So let's plug it into our calculator. Obviously 17 is not divided by, uh, divisible by three because 17 is prime. So two times 16 plus one divided by three. All right, so in the case that k is equal to two, 
we get 32 plus 1 over 3 equals 33 over 3 equals 11. So we have that 3 to the negative 1 is equal to the equivalence class corresponding to 11. All right, we have, okay, nth group is 16, repeat that. Let's state the definition of a group. Okay, so a group is a set along with a binary operation from that set to itself that is associative, has identity, and has inverses for every element in that group. I'll explain a single method that will describe, uh, will decide if a subset of a group is itself a sub uh, subgroup. So assuming that the subset is not empty, if for any two elements, um, g and h in that group, we have g times h to the negative one is in that group, then that means that the group will be a subgroup. Um, we give the origin of the term abelian for a commutative group. Wait, does this go over the history of it? I think there was some guy named Abel who did some work with groups. Let's check the historical note on Joseph Lee Grange. Where's Abel? I'm just not going to worry about that for now. Um, give an example of groups you've seen in your previous mathematical experience, but that is not an example in this chapter. Um, vector spaces are actually themselves groups. For example, like R squared is a group which has component-wise addition. Um, we have for any field, if you work with any like, uh, if you work with this like field theory stuff. We have a lot of that involves a lot of groups. We have matrix groups. We have topological groups. We have things like that. Yeah, okay. This is, how many exercises do we have? Oh, God, we have a good amount of exercises. Oh, gosh, okay. So, all right, I'm gonna take a short little break and then we'll dive straight into the exercises. So. Okay, let me check that everything is going correct, and that I can hear myself. Let me just loudly eat this one treat I got during the intermission. Oh gosh, can I hear myself? All right, there we go, there we go, go. All right, so I'm not gonna start working yet. Um, I'm gonna look ahead at these exercises while I'm just like eating some treats. So I don't have a moment like yesterday where I just completely failed to do math correctly. All right. 
Mm. Oh, okay, okay. So, I'm thinking for each of these, I'll do, like, maybe the first two problems and the last two problems, if we have a lot of things like this, or, like, the first and the last problems. Because there's a lot of stuff where, like, the last problems will be something particularly tricky. But the first problems will just be, like, the pure idea. Oh, it's the following. Oh, my group. It's for answer. Paley tables. So much trees around us. Wow. The multiplication table for each roll. Mm -hmm. Oh, A star B. Oh, that was a fun group if I remember correctly. Also, laying out all my cards on the table. I had read through this book in 2020. Um, I don't know a lot of the 2021 stuff that they've added, so I could just be completely screwed. Oh, the Heisenberg group. Oh, no. Oh, that's going to be fun. Hmm. Hmm. For 13, if I, I don't know if I should just preview a bit of ring theory. Nah, nah. Because that's actually not what's important about it. Give an example of three different groups with eight elements. Why are the groups different? Show that there are n factorial permutations of a set containing n items. That's a really important proof for something later on. Um, prove that, prove that, prove that. Oh my gosh, I don't know if we're going to be doing the detecting errors. Because it could be cool. If I have time, I'll do this. Because I've never actually done a lot of the applications in this book. Because I've done a lot of just pure maths. So, if we get to it, that might be cool. I'm definitely not going to be doing all... Oh god, how many exercises is it? 54? That's painful, but I'll be, do, I'll be trying to do a fair amount of them. Okay, so first of all, let me clear up some of the board. Actually, I'll I'll bring you along the journey with me to see how it's like cleaning up this board. Also, okay, uh, eh, okay, I'm not gonna go Khan Academy colors just yet. I could go like easily go Khan Academy colors, but like, nah. Oh yeah, because also there's this whole section here that I've just like scrapped together, so it would like bleed over if I tried to do this. It'd be like, you couldn't see anything. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get to work. So standard textbook soon. All right, so. We'll start by doing a lot of the computation stuff. We'll do the computation stuff and this stuff so you can see what's going on right behind it. So find all x and z satisfying the following equations. So first we have that 3x is congruent to 2. X, 3x is congruent to 2. Mod 7. Something nice here is that because of the previous theorem, we just need to find, like, we just need to find the con congruence class that x corresponds to, and then because we have integers modulo n being a group, we have all the info. So, what 3x is congruent to 2 mod 7 means is that 3x minus 2 is congruent to 0 mod 7, which means that 3x minus 2 is equal to k times 7. So we just need to find a value of x such that 3x minus 2 over 7 is equal to k. Which literally just means that 7 divides 3x minus 2. So let's start working through. 
So first of all, obviously, obviously two isn't going to work here. A one or two isn't going to work here. So nine minus two, for in this case, x would be equal to, is equal to, oh, hey, look, it's seven. So we have that x is equal to the uh, congruence class of integers mod two. Let's solve this equation. Actually, wait, no, is that right? No, yeah, I was being dumb, I'm sorry. Um, I uh, I lied to you guys all. Uh, it's the congruent class of integers 3, since 9 is 3 times 3. Uh, if you want to very explicitly prove it, if you want to see that this method isn't just madness, like, so suppose um, 7, so 3 plus 7 times k. Then 3, we want to show that 3 times 3 plus 7 times k minus 2 divides 7. So 3 times, or well, not necessarily divide 7, but actually, oh wait, it would be kind of the other way around. I'm not going to worry about it too much. So 3. Uh, we compute this to get, oh gosh, which also I should quick note here, this corresponds to the congruence class 3, which is 9 plus 3 times 7 times k minus 2 equals 7 plus 3 times 7 times k equals 7, 1, plus 3k, which will always be congruent to 0 mod 7. So, uh, then, okay, the rest of these are a very similar thing. Um, so let's just go to the final one. 3x, um, 3 x is congruent to 1 mod 6. So 3x minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod 6. So we need to find ax such that 3x minus 1, um, well, such that 6 divides 3x minus 1. So computing this, we have that 6 does not divide negative 1, 6 does not divide 2, 6 does not divide 5, 6 does not divide 8, 6 does not divide 11, 6 does not divide 15, but we actually have it 6 divides 8. Uh, 18. Now note that this corresponds to k equals 0, k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3, k equals 4, k 5, k Wait a minute. Oh, I was being dumb, wasn't I? Wait, let's think. Minus one. Control minus one. Ah, yeah, I was being dumb. I was being dumb. Give me a second. Six does not divide. Okay, equals five. Fourteen. We have six does not divide. Seventeen. Six does not divide. Oh gosh, I'm I'm getting very so like I'm, I'm expecting to make a very dumb mistake here. 
six doesn't define. Six doesn't define twenty six. Six doesn't define twenty nine. Actually, wait, let me think. Oh, wait, no. Okay. Let me be smart here. Okay. Yes, yes, that's okay. So I'm having a situation like I had last night where I'm trying to solve a problem that's fundamentally unsolvable. Alright, so, suppose that 3x equals 6 times k plus 1. Suppose this was true. However, if we can divide x to be equal to 2 times k plus 1 over third, uh, 1 over 3, this is always not three exclamation marks an integer this is always not an integer and because x is always not an integer well three times like fundamentally we have that x is not going to be this and because we're thinking about all like x in we're thinking about all about all integers x well then this simply says that there is no integer x such that 3x is congruent to 1 mod 6. Um, fundamentally this comes down to the fact that 3 divides 6 and as such it does not have a unit inverse okay all right i won't i won't be that lazy again okay so, which of the following multiplications define the tables defined on the group G equals ABCD forms a group? Support your answer in each case. So, for A, first of all, let's note that A, um, we have A, B, C, and D. We have for example, A, this doesn't seem to look like it has a... Yeah, for any of these, suppose A was the identity element here, right? Um, then this should be A, B, C, D. And that works on the right inverse, but as a left inverse, it sends B to C. It doesn't send B back to B, so A can't be the identity. Likewise for B, likewise for C. And while D looks fine at first, it sends B to D. There is no identity element in this case. So A cannot be a Cayley table over I corresponding to a group. Let's just, I'm also just going to jump forward to D because it's fundamentally a similar analysis. Um, for this, A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D. First of all, A is making itself look like the identity element right now. B. So we have B as the inverse for B. Ah, okay, okay. So, D also cannot be a group from the looks of it. Um, why? Well, ironically enough, D is the downfall of Z. So, if D times A is equal to D, then that implies that A is the identity for, like, the group, right? But then, D times B is equal to D. Which implies that would like we would have both A and B be the identity element. However, for the other ones, we actually don't have that correspondence continue. We have like um, B times B is equal to A. We don't have a nice identity structure on this. This is kind of almost pretending to have two identities in its group at once. Therefore, it can't be a group because we had previously proved that identities were unique. All right, write out the Cayley tables form for the symmetries of a blank. And for Z4, okay, actually, wait. So, the Cayley table for the groups of symmetries formed by a rectangle. We have the identity. We have 180. We have a vertical flip. And we have a horizontal flip. ID, 180, vert. Horizontal. 
So we have ID and ID. First of all, ID sends everything to itself. ID is like valid. Vert. Where is 180? Vert. Horizontal. If we compose to 180, actually with all these, we see that we compose any element with itself twice and we get back to ID. So IDs go all along the diagonal on this. Now, if we flip a rectangle by 180 degrees and then flip it vertically, it must be the same. It's actually easy to see that it must be the same as a horizontal thing. Because we know that every element has a unique inverse, because of a group, we can kind of automatically fill out the table by just choosing what it must not be. So it must be a vert here, vert horse ID, it must be 180 here, it must be uh, 180 here, it must be a vertical here. Now, uh, we have this table, let me just like horribly compress this table, All right, like smoosh it up a little. The Cayley table for, what is it we're going to write, Z4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, we have 1, 2, and already, just writing out up to this point, we can, like, note easily that this is not, these two groups are not, we'll call them later isomorphic, they're not the same. Because any element in this group composed with itself is the same as the original thing, right? But here we have two elements, one and one, we compose it with itself and we get something different, we get something that isn't the identity. So fundamentally these groups already just writing out that much of the table are not the same. Um, we're not going to be worrying about the symmetries of rhombus or a square. Uh, we give a multiplication table for the group U12. All right, I'll do this one. So U12. Let's note that this is equal to U of 2 times 3. So every factor co-prime to, wait, no, not U times 3. 2 times 2 times 3. Right. Um, let me check this. 12. So we have 1. We have not four, five, not six, seven, not eight, not nine, not ten, eleven. So one, five, seven, eleven. So we need to simply just compose everything and see what we get. So one, five, seven, eleven. One, five, seven, eleven. So five times five equals twenty five. 25 minus 24 means it's equivalent and congruent to 1. 7 times 7 equals 49 minus, well, 48. 48 is congruent to 0 minus 12 is equal to 1. It seems like also if we multiply 11 by 11 and we subtract 12 enough times, we get that it's also equivalent to 1. So for all these, we have um, x times x is equal to 1. We have every element is, there's, oh god, there's a term for it, like boolean or something like that, where every element is its own inverse. All right, now, 5 times 7, we must know that actually is equal to 11. Because it can't be that one of these elements are already the identity, we already have the identity. And then we can also fill out that because the group is uh, the table's commutative. And then we just simply fill out the table. Something very nice about knowing that this is a group is that the tables are simply a matter of like what must be true in this case. So 7, 11, 1, we must have a 5 in here. And we must have a 5 in here. Because we can write down a corresponding equation that must have a solution. So this is the Cayley table for U12. Yeah. 
Um, Actually, okay. So like, let's. Oh wait, actually, yeah. I think it all. They, they already gave a proof, but I want to do another proof. In the group UN, if G is in UN, G squared equals one is congruent to one. Um, I don't. Know. I just want to prove this uh, real quick. First of all, if G is in that, then we know that GCD of G. Yeah, reminder that this isn't an exercise, just a personal thing, is equal to 1. So RG plus NS is equal to 1. So RG is equal to NS plus 1. RG plus NS is equal to 1. So G is equal to an S plus 1 over R. Actually, X plus 1. Oh, wait, let me, let me think about this carefully. G squared is equal to RG. So we have, yeah, okay, RG squared, RG that, so RG squared equals R squared, G squared equals N squared. Actually, it will just turn into a group of some K times S. It'll be a disgusting K, and then it'll be plus one. Yeah, which fundamentally is will just still show the exact same thing. Okay, cool. that's a satisfying enough result for me. All right. Yeah, it will basically be reiterating the same arguments. I'm pretty sure this section went through the book in the same exact argument, but whatever, whatever. Okay. A multiplication table for the group of twelve. We did that. Let s equal r one and define. We define A times B is equal to, for real numbers, for non-negative one, for R minus negative one, we define A, that disgusting operation B, by A plus B plus AB. So first of all, we have that A, first of all, it's very obvious to see that A, that, um, it's very obvious to see that A plus minus B equals A plus about A star B is equal to B star A, just by the commutativity of everything in this. So for inverses and identity, we only need to show our inverses and identity, yeah. We need to only show them one way. So first of all, A plus or minus B, A plus or minus, not B, A star 0 is equal to just A. So we have 0 as the identity. So we have also A star A to the negative 1 equals A plus A to the negative 1 plus A to the negative 1 A, which is equal to a to the negative 1, 1 plus a plus a. So let this be equal to y, or let this be equal to 0. So we have negative a is greater than 1 plus a is equal to a to the negative 1. So we have inverses. And so we showed identity, we showed inverse, um, and the inverse is well defined because we have a we don't have negative one here. We've explicitly banned it. And from here, we also have it's very easy to show that by composition of the functions up here, 
by associativity of that, we have associativity of the entire operation. That's very tedious, so I'm just not going to write out, for the sake of time, not going to write out all these steps in that. Alright, um, give an example of two elements, a, b, uh, a, and b, and g, l, two of r, with a, b not equal to b, a. I'm going to assume that if you're watching this, you've done a linear, like enough linear algebra to not need an example of that, to know that the group is non-commutative. Prove that the product of two matrices in SL2 R R has determinant one. Okay, so suppose that A, B, C, D, A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime equals A, A prime plus B, C prime, A, B prime plus B D prime C A prime plus D C prime and then C B prime plus D D prime. The determinant of this is A A prime plus B C prime. C B prime plus D D prime A D is it A D minus B C or A D plus B C? Wait, give me a second to of a matrix. Cause I think it's A D minus B C right? I just want to double check because I don't trust myself to remember whether or not it was a plus or a minus sign there. Um, okay, it's minus. It's a minus sign there. Minus C A prime plus D C prime a B prime plus I think that's a B D prime my writing is oof okay also we're going to just like write out A A prime C B prime plus A A prime D D prime plus B C prime C B prime plus B C prime D D prime plus I oh know no not plus very important I don't do that here minus C A prime A B prime plus D, no, no, the way I'm doing this, C, A prime, um, times B, D prime, plus, oh my gosh, again, plus D, C prime, A, B prime, plus D, C prime, B, D prime. First of all, let's also note, just for future reference, because this is what we're ultimately going to be showing the equivalence of, AD minus BC times times A prime D prime minus B prime C prime equals A D A prime D prime minus a d b prime c prime minus b c a prime d prime plus b c b prime d prime all right now we have these things we got to cancel some stuff out um Gosh, okay. Where do I begin? 
So we have a, a prime, c, b prime. Theorems. Oh, we actually have this terms right here. We can cancel these terms out. A, a prime, d, d prime. Uh, do we have any? We don't have a combination of a's and a prime, so that's staying in there. B, c prime, c, b prime. B, all right, so we don't have b, c prime, c, b prime. We don't have that. Also, it's going to appear in that term, so that's fine. B, c prime, d, d prime. B, c prime, d, d prime. So we're then able to cancel these out. So we can write this as being equal to a, a prime, d, d prime, plus b, c prime, c, d prime, minus a prime, b, c, d prime, minus d, c prime, a, b prime, which by just rearranging terms, we can see that these are actually the same thing, which means that because this is determinant of a, right? This is determinant of a, and this is the determinant of b. We have the determinant of a b equals determinant of a times determinant of b. And the question is asking about the special linear group. And each special linear group has determinant 1, and 1 times 1 is always 1, so the product of any two matrices in the special linear group is again 1, as required. Gosh, that algebra is, not, is definitely not pretty. <laughs> Alright. Proof that the set of matrices of the form? No. <laughs> okay, this is... The group of matrix multiplication this group does the Heisenberg group is important in quantum physics. Matrix multiplication, the Heisenberg group is defined by okay. I'm not gonna do this because oh my gosh. We have that in each of these each of these um individual operations satisfy for just tuples x, y, and z. Um each of these operations satisfy... Okay, okay, I guess a better way to show this is that the matrices in here are kind of unnecessary. We really instead just have x, y, we have an operation star, x, y, z. Yeah, okay, so a better way to think about this problem is that we have an operation star that takes A, B, C, star, A prime, B prime, C prime, which is equal to, what do they write it as? A plus A prime, B plus B prime plus A C, B plus B prime plus AC prime AC prime C plus C prime uh, This is really, if you look at this, this is just the, t um, the top middle uh, matrix entry This is the top right matrix entry This is the rightmost, right middle matrix entry and we just basically take out all the other matrix stuff that's just kind of unnecessary in this. And it's showing that this is a group. And the main thing is that for each of these operations, um, each of these operations is already a group operation. Kind of. Oh gosh, it's, it's very strange to explain, but basically you can prove it using this abstract form, that we have a group operation, the associativity of stuff in here, and the associativity of these. The associativity of the individual operators is what gives you your proper thing. And you can compute the inverse of any, like a unique inverse, because all of these have unique inverses with how they're set up. 
Yeah, because this is going to be an absolute mess of a terror of a computation. For the sake of time, I'm going to not do this one. I'm going to leave this as exercise for the viewer. All right. Prove that determinant of A, B equals determinant of A, determinant of B in GL2. We actually already proved that earlier, so it shows that the operation in the group is closed. So if A and B are in GL2 of R, then A and B is in GL2 R. Um, for this, You know, okay, I want to prove a more general thing. This is like kind of cool, but suppose we have a group, let's do a more general construction. Let's suppose we have a group G and that. Now, we let G of N, not G of N, uh, G of N equals G times G times on and on times G. And then what's this notation? N times. And we define circle N from GN, G of N times G of N to G of N by A1, A2, A to the N composed with b1, b2, all the way up to b to the n equals a1 composed with b1 on and on up to a n composed with b n. Then g n circle n is a group. Now, noting this definition, let's actually, let's prove it, let's prove it. So first of all, obviously the, like, circle n is a well-defined operation, and we also have, we're not going to worry about associativity, because associativity is true for each of the components, we already know it's going to be true. So we just need to show the inverse, and obviously, 0, 0, all the way up to 0 is going to be your identity. Um, your identity, because it's going to be an identity on each component, and if we have A, A1, A2, blah blah blah, AN equals, let's call it big A, and big A to the negative 1 equals A1 to the negative 1, A2 to the negative 1, on and on, to AN to the negative 1. Because if you compose, uh, because A a1 is going to be equal to a1, a1 to the negative 1 to an, an to the negative 1 equals 0, 0, on, on to 0, which is equal to the identity. So the construction for the specific problem for the integers mod 2 is just a subcase. It's just a subcase of the one where we have any group raised um, with the set raised um, to the nth power multiplied by itself n times, like as a Cartesian product. I'm grabbing a drink of water real quick. Show that r star equals r minus, uh, minus eh. Eh. Um, given the groups R star and Z, let's see. Alright, so 13 is... I'm not going to worry about 13 so much right now. Um, 14. Yeah, because this is covered in ring theory. Like, better examples. 14. This, okay, this is a specific case that I want to show something else general. So suppose we have groups A and B. Actually, let's, com let's denote it by this. We'll have the group A with the uh, normal composition, and we'll have the group B with the times composition. And now, we define A times B. Actually, no, for the sake of this, I should use the... 
For the sake of this, I should use the plus notation on B. A times B, we define the group A times B, circle times plus, to be equal to, well, the operation is going to be equal to A, B, circle times plus, C, D, is equal to A, circle, C, B plus D. Then, A times B, circle times plus, is a group. It should be easy to see, since associativity, uh, associativity follows from associativity in the respective operations. Um, the inverse is, is just the inverse for each group, and just put up as a, like, a pairwise component. And then the identity is just a zero element of each group in a component. Um, and this is fundamentally as well what was going on in the previous example when we were multiplying things a certain number of times. Um, actually, okay, you know what? In this case, I'll give I'll give a formula, uh, formal proof. Um, I will also just call this for now. I will just call this operation dot. Or actually, no, I'll call this operation times for now. So, a, b, times. C uh, C, D, times E, F. First we do that, and we get A composed with C, B plus D, times E, F, equals a composed with C, composed with E, B plus D plus F. Now what we're going to do is we're going to be cool and just we're just going to take that we're going to move it up here. Also, I should probably, for people who are tuning in, just like highlight that is equal to A composed with C composed with E, B plus D plus F is equal to A, A. B times C composed with E, D plus F is equal to A, B times C, D times E, F. Um, fundamentally, this has to do with a certain type of product of groups that we're building here. Okay. So, we have this. Yeah, actually, I'm not going to go... Uh, okay. Also, I think it should be, like, the associativity, like, seeing this and the spirit of this is what you would use to prove the inverses and the identity for either one of them. So, we're going to assume that as being a satisfying proof. Um, proof to prove that every group containing six elements is abelian. So, uh, let's find every element containing every set, every group containing six groups or six elements. So, first of all, if a group, let's let's think a bit more carefully about this. This will be a preview ahead. So, let's say a group has elements A, B, C. D, A, B, C, D, E, F. First of all, we have that either A1 is equal to E, it, I mean, 
No, no, because you could have a group of order six. So let's hmm. let's think of a, I'm trying to think of a cleverer way than just like brute forcing it. So let's have let's just have a be equal. Let's have e be our identity. So I'm wondering, first of all, if a a equals e for all a in a group G is G abelian. Let's think about it. A, B. B. No, it doesn't look like improve it. Oh, no. Ah, oh, gosh, I don't want to. I don't want to write down all groups of order six. <laughs> it sounds painful. But you know, okay. Screw it. I'll bite the bullet. E one, two, three, four, five. So, E. So we first want to uh, everything one rack. So. If one times one is equal to two, actually, wait, wait, wait. Let me think more carefully about this. Because I feel like there's a general result that I could use. So. Suppose G is non abelian, right? Then there exists A, B, and G with A, B not being equal to B, A. Are there an even or an odd number of such elements? So if AB is not equal to BI, right? Gosh, I'm having myself a think. I'm having myself a think. So, A, B is in G. Implies that A, B is not this way. Okay. There are an abelian, there's an abelian group of every order, right? Just think of the integers mod n. If we want a group of order n, then we just take the abelian group of that. But there are certain cases where a non-abelian order group will have to have a certain order. All right, so we're going to be thinking about the cardinality of the set of all a slash and g such that there exists a b g with a b not equal to b a. Right? And this necessarily must be even? Because if A is in G and AB is not equal to BA, then B is also in G. So for every element A in this, we can find a respective element B 
which is A, B, Zyklon P, A. Right? Well, actually, no. Let's think about it. Let's suppose that A, B is not equal to B, A, and B, C is not equal to C, D. It's not necessarily the case that C is equal to A. Oh gosh. Let's think about something more carefully. So, hmm. if, all right, so if an element in a group A, first of all, let's define the order of an element in A to be the number, the minimum, or well, the minimum, yeah, the minimum of n greater than zero, such that a to the n equals zero. Oh, actually, no. So, okay, let's think, let's think. So first of all, if g is going to be equal to Oh gosh, I'm trying to be clever about it, but like, I can't, and if at this point it'll eventually be something where like, I might as well just like, write them, write them all out. Containing six elements is a billion. So first of all, let's write, let's write an example group. We have the group E. Then we have the group A, we have element A and B. Right, multiply that on either side of A and either side. Yeah. We multiply it by B on the left side to get B A. On the right side to get something A. Maybe. So it'll be equal to multiplying on the left for that A and multiplying by A. Now this will be a group with exactly one, two, three, four, five elements. Now, if we define a of a to be equal to zero, b, b to be equal to zero, the multiplication of these elements on one side by a will get us back to a previous element, while uniquely the element a, b. This will show a group, a not a billion group of order five. I'm feeling like, oh gosh, this is confusing me because I'm feeling like this is like this example is showing me that this looks like a proper group, right? And I'm wondering if every non abelian group has to have odd order. So let's think about it. Suppose we have a group G and we have a group uh, such that, okay, let's show that every, maybe every even group. Every group of even order, uh, she is equal to two times k. Oh gosh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know where to go from here. There are so many different places we can go. Okay, you know what? Uh, what question was this? Uh, fifteen. For the sake of just like sanity. 
I'm not going to check every single possible group of Order 6, because that's horrible. <laughs> but I will write that down for later. Uh, number 15, was it? Um, to find a proof or a disproof of. Okay. So, give an example of three group, different group state elements. Why are the groups different? We're not going to worry about that right now. Um, because I don't like giving examples of abstract groups yet, because there are so many tools we haven't developed. Um, and I want to keep things moving at a relatively decent pace. Okay. So, 18. Show that there are n factorial permutations of a set containing n items. This is actually a perfect example of induction. So, for case... The case of... 0 factorial, right? It's the empty set. Um, there is... <laughs> there is technically... There is technically a function. The function from the empty set to the empty set. That assigns nothing to nothing. Uh, which is the only function there is, and is technically bijective, in the most loose sense of the word. It's kind of like how any function from the empty set to a set uh, is injective, inherently. So we have the case that... Um, we have the case that s sub 0 is equal to 1, is equal to 1 factorial. Now, okay, suppose that, suppose that x is equal to n has n factorial permutations. And let y be equal to x union, let's call this extra element e for extra. So any bijective function y to y have, there are two cases either uh, p of e equals e or p of e not equal to e if p of e uh, so first of all, if p of e equals e, then we can just restrict this uh, to pi is equal to p sub x. And we know that there are n factorial different permutations of this. Um, so there are n factorial different permutations of this. So now p of e, if p of e is not equal to e, So there are n factorial of these. And for each of these, yeah, uh, let me think about how to, let me think about how to like phrase this into an argument. So if P of E is not equal to E factorial of these if p of e is equal to e let p of e be equal to x now what we do is since p of e is equal to x we identify these as the hmm no, that's not going to be very clean. N plus one. All right, so P of E is equal to X. We let Z be equal to the set. Okay, I go. I'm thinking. I'm thinking again how to get this. It's going to be kind of messy, but it will work. So z is equal to the set um, y minus 
e, or y minus x. Actually, we can say y minus e. And now how we define this is that we define the permutation p from z to z uh, to be equal to p of pi of e equals p of p of x and if p of y is equal to x oh no Okay, let me think. Let me think about a better way to do this because this is disgusting. This is horrible. Okay. So the way we can do this is suppose x the op the cardinality of x is equal to n. So we can write it out as x might as well be equal to the set one to all the way up to n. As in, the set x is bijective with this set, and as such, the amount of permutations on this set is the amount of permutations on x, right? So we have that the cardinality of s of x, the amount of permutations, is the amount of The amount of permutations the amount of per okay it's how do I how do I best express this so it's the amount of ways choose one Okay. The way I'm thinking about this, the way I'm thinking about this, the way I'm conceptualizing this, is that the amount of permutations will be the amount of permutations that swap two elements, plus the amount of permutations that swap three elements, plus the amount of permutations that swap four elements, all the way to the amount of permutations that swap n elements. So first of all, the amount of permutations that swap no elements will be n choose 0 of s1. And the amount of permutations that swap two elements, because we can't swap one element, right? Because if we just swapped one element, it would just be the identity. So plus the amount of permutations that swap two elements. So it'll be, we choose two of the things and swap them times s2. Wait, no. Oh, okay, okay. Wait, okay, let me think, let me think, let me think. Okay. So first of all, there is only one permutation s1. So it's kind of a cop-out to say n choose 0 cardinality of s1. Now, let's say, let's choose two elements from this. And with those two elements, mm, this is where it gets complicated. Okay, okay. So, okay, first of all, oh my gosh, yeah, this is particularly, this is particularly messy. Yeah, okay, so from the looks of it, it's going to be much better doing it this way. So...
But yeah, like, the induction is going to be the best way to do this. So, S1, the cardinality of S1 is just the uh, cardinality of bijection functions from 1 to 1, or the 1 element set to the 1 element set equals 1, equals 1 factorial. Now, suppose that the absolute value of x uh, equals n plus 1. So we have x is at least bijective to the set. 1, 2, all the way up to n plus 1. Then a permutation p from x to x. The amount of permutations from x to x, first of all, will be the amount of permutations p uh, from x minus n plus 1 as a set. Because these, the amount of permutations from x minus n plus 1 to x minus n plus 1 is just the amount of permutations that fix n, uh, 1 up to n, which from induction we know is n factorial. It was n factorial. God, how do I, how do I write this out? Okay, well, okay. Actually, let's think about this in a different way. So, let's think about it. A permutation from x to x will be a permutation um, Okay. x minus n plus 1 to x minus n plus 1 composed with a permutation pi or a function from okay okay wait wait here we go here we go So first of all, okay, let's say we have a set 1, 2, all the way to n plus 1. Now, a permutation from this set, any permutation from this set can be thought of as the following. It will be a permutation on the first n characters or first n symbols. So we'll call this p1. Followed by a permutation that shuffles around n plus 1. Oh, yes! Okay, okay. Got it, got it. Yeah. Let's call this p2. So any permutation p has elements, has a set P2 circle P1. Any permutation P can ex be expressed as this form P2 circle P1, where P1 is a permutation, and P2, uh, p yeah, P1 is a permutation, term of permutation of x that fixes n plus 1 per 
permutation of x. x is 1, 2, 2, n. Alright, okay. Oh, it's all coming together. This is very nice. So any permutation p has is in the form a permutation of x that fixes n plus 1, followed by a permutation of x that fixes 1 up to n. So it's a permutation that doesn't move n plus 1 times a permutation that fixes, um, that doesn't move the first n characters. Now, first of all, as well, as well, this is the extremely nice thing, note that this expression is unique, right? Notice that if p1, uh, actually, yeah, let me write this. So p2, p1 equals p2 prime, p1 prime, if and only if, p1 equals p1 prime, and p2 equals p2 prime. Uh, why is that? So, Okay, let me, like, I know it's true, but let me just try to quickly find the words for this. So, P1 um, will shuffle around characters, and if P1, P2 is, okay, hmm. Yes, okay, so, suppose you have X after being shuffled by P1, P2, right? Uh, suppose you have X after being shuffled by P1, P2. Well then, you know that because n plus, uh, x, the second permutation, um, the first permutation fixed n plus 1, you can find the second permutation uniquely by swapping around n plus 1 and whatever is now in the n plus 1 th place of your set, because we're thinking about finite sets. And that must be unique, because otherwise it would literally just correspond to a different p1 and p2. It's impossible to shuffle it around. Fundamentally, it's by the fact that these are bijections and the certain like properties of things that are fixed by the bijections. Uh, there's a more formal argument you can write up, but for now, just know that this is true. Now, what are the total number of permutations in this form? Uh, in this form? Well, this is n factorial, right? By the inductive hypothesis. And this is n plus 1. Because realize that n plus 1 can be sent to either of the n places, or it can be sent to itself. It can be the identity permutation. So in total, there are n factorial n plus 1 permutations of n plus uh, x, which is equal to n plus 1 factorial permutations. Oh, that's satisfying. That's very satisfying. Okay. Shh. That's a very combinatorics esque argument. Okay, okay. Let me take another second. Not going to be a proper intermission, but just a proper second to just grab a drink of this wonderful birch beer that I have by my side. How to drink? Let's keep going. So, show that 0 plus a equals uh, congruent to a plus 0 is congruent to a for all the yeah. end. Um, this just comes fundamentally back to the fact that 0 plus a is equal to a plus 0 is equal to a. Um, which that I'm not going to blabber on, because also it's going to be more obvious when we get to eventually we'll be uh, looking at these things called quotient groups. Which is going to show that this fact trivially holds true for any quotient group, because the integers mod n, you will actually even sometimes see the integers mod n, so z mod n. You'll see it written as z over n z uh, as a quotient group, and that fact will simply follow from there. So, 
uh, prove that there is a multiplicative inverse for the introverse module n. So it's um, once again a times one is equal to a. Um, so a times one is congruent to a. Uh, for each a and z n, find element b and z n. Okay, this is fun. So suppose that a plus b is congruent to zero mod n. This means that a plus b is equal to k times n. So a is equal to k times n minus b. And now, for this, we just simply let this be the, like, b will be equal to, or no, a is equal to, let's call it alpha n plus beta, right? So alpha n plus beta is equal to k times n minus b. We get that b is equal to k times al uh, k times alpha n minus beta. Uh, which fundamentally, because there is a certain integer multiple of n above beta, means that we can write it out as a uh, that b is congruent to n minus a. It'll just be some certain integer multiple above that. Uh, just because L, alpha and beta could be arbitrarily large, or because since a can be arbitrarily large, but if we just worry about the congruence classes, that will hold true. So, shell addition and multiplication mod n are well defined operations. Addition uh, that will be something else, and the fact that these subgroups are normal, so I'm not going to worry about that. Show the addition and multiplications are associative. Uh, we already got it. We show that the multiplication distributes over addition. That's for ring theory. Uh, let a and b be elements. Uh, prove that a b to the n, a to the negative 1 equals a b a to the negative 1 n for n and z. Yeah, it's kind of used, not really. So I'm not going to worry about that for right now. Uh, okay, let's get Okay, so I have Okay, so. That's good in 2. There's an element k. Such that k is squared to equal to 1, k is not equal to 1. That just comes to the fact that every, in the unitary group, um, every element squared seems to be its own multiplicative inverse. Um, for the inverse of that is that. That's boring, and it's just a simple deduction for the remainder. Um, oh gosh, I don't know how many of these I should prove. I'll prove... If you group, then the equations x a equals b. Oh, you know, yeah, that already had half the proof shown already, so I'll worry about that. So, theorem 3.23. So, Oh wait, no, that's boring now. That's literally just a ton of inductions. Okay. <laughs> so we'll worry about the later. Pre the left and right cancellation laws for a group that is uh, shown in any group. G, B, A equals C, A implies B equals C, and A, uh, A, B equals A, C implies B equals C for group uh, for elements. So, okay, okay. So we'll do the left cancellation laws. B, A equals C, A. Well, we can call this X. Right? Let's just call this abstract element x. And we know that x a to the negative 1 is equal to x a to the negative 1 just by what it means for two expressions to be equal. So we know that b a a to the negative 1 is equal to c a a to the negative 1. And once again, a very important example of associativity. Uh, we can remove the parentheses a to the negative 1 here to be equal to c a a to negative one we need the associativity axiom to be able to do this it's very important to know uh, to obtain that b is equal to c yeah fundamentally you can see the axioms of a group are what allow us to solve those linear types of equations with left and right cancellation sure if g is a finite group of even order then there is an element a in g such that a is not the identity and a squared is equal to g Hey, there are multiple ways you can prove this. A lot of it will be from this thing called Lagrange's theorem. But, okay. 
Ah, yes, let's do this. Let's do this. I guess. So we have that a. Suppose we have any element a because a is a group of even order. We know that there's an a such that a is not e. Right now, this means that fundamentally, a to the n will be equal to e for some n. Uh, since it will only cycle through, like a can't cycle back to itself because otherwise it'd be the identity element. So it needs to cycle around, but it can only cycle to so many places before it hits e. It's a kind of fundamentally a pigeonhole principle type situation. Let's think. Let's think about how we can proceed from here. Okay, it's important to note that even order, even order here, uh, right? Let me double check if she has a finite of even order. Yes, okay. There's a finite group of even order. Hmm. I'm trying to think, ah, oh, there's some way to prove this. I'm going to have to quick refresh my brain. So order of G is equal to two times K. And there's a, there's a certain use of Lagrange's theorem here, but I'm assuming it's wanting us to not work with Lagrange's theorem. So also, from here we have a n squared is equal to e equals a to the n squared is equal to e squared with these parentheses a to n. It's equal to e. No, okay. Hmm. I mean, could we do something on the number of permutations? Because basically, uh, we have a permutation called, we'll call it lambda a, from g to g, which is defines lambda a of g uh, lambda a of g equals g composed with a and there are 2k of these permutations Is these permutations on G? Two K of these permutations. So lambda A of G is equal to G composed with A. We have two K of these permutations. What does that tell us? Wait, okay, okay. Let's think let's think more carefully about this. So G let's let's click right as a note. The order of G is equal to two K. So first of all, it should be clear that A to the two K 
is equal to E. Well, actually, uh, not necessarily. Hmm, wait, actually, would that be the case? Okay, wait, wait. First of all, let's let's try. Let's think about something. So suppose the order of G is equal to M, and A is in G. Is A to the M equal to the identity element? A to the M equal to the identity element. Let's think about this. Like I'm, I'm feeling like it would be the case. I'm just trying to think of a proof. I don't know if we can necessarily do something inductive on this. How do I prove this? Okay, because I have a feeling in my bones that it is true. So okay. All right. So for this, we let the order of a equal the minimum number of k the minimum n greater than zero n greater than zero such that a to the n equals e I think it will be easy to prove that a is less than or equal to m. Because if you run into a cycle, that means you've had a new identity element if you're not already the identity element. So we know that the order of a is less than or equal to m. Does the order of a divide m? The order of a divide m? Like, I actually, okay, I know the answer, but the question is more so, how do you prove it? Hmm. So, like, suppose the order of A equals N. So, A to the N equals M. One way of saying that is that First of all, the set of all a to the k for k and z is, we'll call, this will be a subgroup, which we'll denote by this. Because m, if the order of a is n, then as such a to the n equals m, then a to the n minus 1 is the identity element. Or a to the k. And the other stuff that's inherent from that group of operations of uh, multiplication. So we have a group. So the order of a is a subgroup, we'll use this notation for now, is a subgroup of g. Now The order of A Okay, 
Okay, let me think. First of all, let me double check what we're actually trying to solve in the first place. I'm gonna be kind of distracted by this. So, um, show that if g square a squared equals e for all elements a in a group g, then g must be a billion. Oh wait, no, that's actually good. If g is a finite group of even order, then there is an a and a such that a is not the identity, and a squared is equal to e. All right, so for now, we're trying to show this that we have that's a um, group G. So, no, the order of A divides. So, the order of A is a subgroup of G. So the order of A divides G. We'll just take this as faith for now, because it will be proved in the next uh, sections with Lagrange's theorem. Order of A divides G. So either order of A divides 2, or order of A, order of A divides 2 again. Um, and because 2 is prime, the order of A divides 2, or the order of A divides K. Yeah, oh gosh, okay, okay. Let me, let me, okay, let me all, one go, let me go back one exercise. Alright, so first of all, Let's go back to 31. Show that if a squared equals e for all elements a in a group g, then g must be abelian. So suppose a squared equals e for all of them. Now a, b, um, a, b, 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 a, a. This is equal to e, this is equal to e. So a, b is equal to that is equal to bi associative a, b, b, b. So, okay, a, b is equal to b, a. I'm wondering, okay, so a, b, we multiply on the left by b, b. A just like well one minute. Hmm. Okay. All right, so we know that A B B A is equal to E. And also, B A, A B is equal to E. So we have that A B, B A is equal to B A, A B, A B. Hmm. Oh gosh, this is confusing me. So A B B A is equal to E. B A A B is equal to E. So A B B A is equal to B A A B. Which is just wait actually E is equal to B A A B. So we multiply on the right side by BA. Oh yeah, okay. So we just take this, we multiply on the right side by BA and BA here to get that BA is equal to, wait, no, it's already, hmm. It's 
maybe. Okay, let's th let's think harder about this, because I'm running into I'm running into some logical walls here. So I think I need to slow down. So a squared is equal to e for all a in g. So we have a b is equal to a b So we have a, a, b, b is equal to e. So a, a, b, b is equal to e. So we multiply on the left by b to get b, a, a, b, B, B is equal to B, which gives us that B, A, A, B is equal to, wait, no, that's wrong, right? So A squared is equal to E, implies that A, A, B, B is equal to E, uh, because it's E times E. Then we have that. Uh, using associativity, A, A, B, B is equal to E. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. B, A equals B, A, B, A, uh, B, A, A, B, B, A is equal to B, A. Wait, let's think, let's think. Okay, so a squared is equal to e. A, a, b, b is equal to e. A, a, b, b is equal to e. Then you multiply on the left by b and on the right by a to get b, a, a, b, b, a is equal to b, a. Which gives us by cancellation stuff that a b b a a b is equal to e. No wait, I'm wondering. Now that we have b a a b is equal to e, uh, and we have that is equal to a a b b. Right by b. If we multiply on the right by b, if we multiply on the right by b, both these multiply on the right, we get b a a equals a a b. b a a equals a a b. Multiply on the right by a to get b a equals a a b a. No, okay, okay. I'm running in circles. So okay, let me think about what we're ultimately trying to prove. We're ultimately trying to prove that a b is equal to b a. This is equivalent to saying that a, b, we multiply on both sides by b, a to get that a, b, 
BA is equal to <sighs> I feel like an idiot. Okay. <laughs> I am a massive idiot. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what it is is let, let's write out the full thing. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> So first, we start with E is equal to E. What this is actually equal to is A, B, B, A. So we're trying, so what we need to show is that A, B, B, A is equal to E. Because if we can show that A, B, B, A is equal to E, so A, B, B, A is equal to E, Okay, yeah. and also A, B, B, A is trivially equal to A, because we take this, yeah, okay. First of all, okay, so for the proof, for, for the proof, for the proof. First note that A, B, B, A equals A, A equals E. Now, note that A, B, B, A Uh, is equal to B, A, B, B, A, B, uh, from this line of logic, we have that A, B, B, A, B, A is equal to B, A, multiplying everything on the right by B, A, right? However, these two elements are the same element, so by the rule of what we have, we have that A, B is equal to B, A made this way more complicated than it needed to be. <laughs> oh well, okay. Oh gosh, no. MS Paint, what are you doing? Okay, uh, delete. All right, show that if G is a finite group of even order, then there is an A and B and G, such as A is not the identity, and A squared is equal to E. So, the order of G equals 2K. So we're going to have that, since the order of g is equal to 2k, suppose a squared is not equal to e for all, for all a in g. Okay, give me a second. <coughs> They're gonna drink. Okay. Suppose a squared is not equal. Uh, a squared is not equal to a for all a and g minus e. Hmm. Okay, because it's basically a C-Lo theorem for the prime p equals two. I'm trying to think about how to do this. Suppose a squared is not equal to e for all a and g miles at minus e. This means that... This means also as well that a squared squared is not equal to e. Oh, and by induction, this means a to the 2 to the n is not equal to e. For all n greater than 0. Oh my god, I'm actually feeling kind of clever. I'm actually feeling kind of clever. Shh. For all n. So, okay, okay, here we go, here we go, I'm getting, I'm getting my math excited again. All right, so, if a squared is not equal to e um, for all a and g, then we know that a squared, um, since it's not equal to e, uh, so, okay, first of all, a squared is not equal to e, 
Uh, so a squared squared is not equal to e. And then a squared 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 is not equal to e. And then what this function only means is that for all n greater than 0, a to the 2 to the n is not equal to e. However, oh, this is cool, this is cool. All right, so a to the 2 to the n is not equal to e. But, OK. Um, is not equal to e. All right, how do I best phrase this? I'm trying to think of like, how would this a to the n is not equal to e. But by the pigeonhole, uh, by pigeonhole principle. Principle. Ah, oh, gosh. Ah, now it's back to being confusing again. I had that one moment of cleverness. Shh. All right, so suppose a squared is not equal to e, right? And a squared squared is not equal to e. And then a true to the n is not equal to e for all n greater than 0. Wait, is it really that simple? But by pigeonhole principle, this is impossible. Actually, no, okay. Because it's nonlinear, uh, this function in the exponent is nonlinear, and that's what's kind of like giving me trouble. Right. Now note there exists a k such that a to the k equals e. Oh not k, the k is not a good variable to use here. A group of even order. So the finiteness is gonna be used for a pigeonhole principle in this. And the even order is going to be used for more specific information. But so far, the even uh, the even information is like kind of like messed me up. Okay. All right. So. Okay, let's think, let's think, let's think. So the order of g is equal to 2k. Okay. So first of all, suppose that... So I wonder if we're going to do this in reverse, where if a squared is not equal to e, we're going to derive some information that means it can't be even. Like, what does it mean for the order of a group to be even? All right, all right, let's think, okay, let's think like this, let's think like this. So, given, given g in g, we define the order of g to be equal to the minimum k greater than zero, such that g to the k equals 1. By the pigeonhole principle, 
Such an element always exists in a finite group, so we know the order of g is well defined. Right? So, if the order of g is equal to 2 times m, then g then g to the yeah then g to the m squared equals e so given the order information about the group we need to find some element g such that it has order 2 times m for some integer m. Because then using this, it will be clear. So, what I want to do is we want to say that the order of g, suppose, okay, assume the order of g is. Alright, so suppose that 2 does not divide the order of g for all g. it might be time to actually make a new mathematical tool to solve this problem. So... So... A nice... division of a group G is some element is some set E G1 G2 all the way to G N actually you can probably just do this if e g1 g2 on and on is a subset of g such that g1 to the n is not equal to g2 to the k G1 to the n is not equal to 2 to the k unless G1 of n equals G2 of k equals e for is s, we'll call it s, for G1, G2, and s. And for all h in g, there exists a g in s such that. Yeah, okay. So let's try to get some stuff off this. So a nice division of a group g is a set S of elements E, G1, G2, on and on as a subgroup. Actually, we should pro I can probably not include E. Yeah, it's kind of essential if we're talking about infinite groups, so might as well. Um, is S equals that? Uh, such that G1 to the N is not equals G2 to the K, or G1, G2, and S, unless G1 to the N equals G2 to the K equals E. And for all N and G, there exists a G in S, um, actually, we there's actually a better word for this. 
looking at a basis of a group G. Um, one and G two. Okay, all the way. Let's see, equal to that. Uh, equals H. So, yeah. Hmm. Ah, I'm just wondering if this is going to be kind of overpowered thinking about it. Because we have a basis of group G's. Let's go that. So, we need to be able to say something about bases of finite groups. Um, let me think. So what I, okay, thinking about it, what I need to show would be that the basis depends on the order in a specific way. The basis depends on the order in a specific way. Uh, the basis tells you something about the order of the elements in that basis. So. So basically what I'm thinking is that each element, so we have, okay, actually wait, let me think about it. We can think better, a basis of G is a set of subgroups, uh, it's a set of subgroups H1, H2, uh, we'll have it for now be a finite set of subgroups. such that h i cap h j is equal to the identity element and g equals h1 h2 all the way up to h n hmm. But then what do I do with this? It's obviously a powerful tool, but like, what specific division can I make? <laughs> Wait, okay, I'm thinking. I'm having I'm having myself think. So first of all, if we also make the restriction in this case. Basis, actually, we'll call it a basis of G is these set of groups. With also, we're going to have H I is not equal to the set E. Then what this means. Oh, is this basically reproving Lagrange's theorem just in a really funky way without cosets? Actually, okay, let me think a bit more carefully about what I'm saying, because this could be bad of them. It's like H1, H2. So suppose we have A, B, and C, D. A, C, and H1, and B, D, and H2. B, D, and H2. Then A. CG. 
their multiplication. If it's commutative, it works out nicely, but if it's not commutative, like intercommutative. Hmm. Shoot. Alright, if I swear. Hmm. Okay, if G is a finite group of even order, then there is an A and G. Not the identity and I square is equal to E. Gosh, I can't think of a very nice and clean contradiction. Ah, oh, man, okay. I'm going to have to come back to this later, because this is just gonna... Oh, okay, also looks like we're having slight technical issues. Okay, okay. Can I be heard? Let me just double check that everything internet wise is going alright. I think I have an idea. I think I have an idea instead for how we might be able to prove this. So, let G be a group. We are going to show that the order of G, all right, first of all, define for every G in G, the order of G to be the minimum, okay, greater than zero, such that k, uh, such that g to the k equals one, or equals e in this case. Now, does the order of g divide the sum to find divide the product perhaps of G and G order of G That's a very like C low theorem, C low esque question. Okay. Hmm.
Ah, God. Ah, okay, I'm just gonna have to, I'm gonna have to shelve this for now. I've been working on this problem for a ridiculous amount of time, and I think it's gonna be something like the problems last time, where I found out the method after, like, a sleep. So, instead of, like, torturing you guys by forcing you guys to continue to watch this, we're just gonna move on for now. Alright, let's should be a group and suppose that a b squared equals a squared b squared for all a and b and g. Prove that g is an abelian group. So, okay. We have that a b squared equals a squared b squared. So, let's kind of work in reverse. Let's kind of work in reverse. So, if a b equals b a, then multiplying on the left side by a gives a squared b equals a b a, and multiplying on the right side gives a squared b, multiplying on the right side, uh, right side by b gives us that a squared b squared equals a b a b, which is equal to a b squared. Well, that was fairly simple. Because <laughs> you can just work reverse using the cancellation properties. So like a b squared uh, is equal to a squared b squared. From that, you get that a squared b is equal to a b a. And from that, you get that a b is equal to b a. So like this chain adduction, you just work up this. All right, so, but why is that problem so easy when 32 is such a nightmare? Okay, find all subgroups of z cubed times z cubed. No. <laughs> okay, so instead of this, so okay, for this instead, to save us the time and effort, use this information to show that z cubed times z cubed is not the same group as z to the ninth. Um, what you should notice is that there is an element of order 9 in z9. Every element in z cubed times z cubed is of order uh, 3. Find all the subgroups of the symmetry groups of an equilateral triangle. Alright, uh, no. Compute the subgroups of the symmetry group of the square. Uh, let h equals 2 to the k, k and z. Show that h is a subgroup of q star. No. <laughs> Because this is just like a change in base and will be studied more when we studied exponentials. And um, the ring and group homomorphisms there. n equals 0 and n is a group of z. Should these subgroups are the only subgroups of z. This is important for later, but. Hmm. Yeah, these problems, these problems are all good individually, but I feel like without a lot of later context, there's not that much value in them. For example, 38 will be in a very important proposition when we get to talking about factor groups um, and showing that the modulo, integers modulo n are like the only subgroups that could be factor groups, but until we get to there, it's not exactly useful. Well, g consists of the 2 by 2 matrices of the form, cos, negative of sine, sine, so, oh, the of theta g is a subgroup of SL2R, so it's the orthogonal matrices, the rotation matrices. Um, prove that g is equal to subgroup first time, the group location, which would be the group of under addition, and h equal a b c d a plus c is equal to zero. Um, prove that h is a subgroup of g. Oh man, a lot of the rest of these exercises are like, there's very interesting stuff, but like, it's not specifically used, like, we don't have enough context to show how useful it is. Let's uh, prove that intersection is She's also a so Actually, okay, wait, 45 is going to be a bigger one later on, so we'll do it now. So suppose, first of all, that h1 and h2 um, are subgroups of a group G. Then we want to prove that h1 intersected the h2 is a subgroup in G. For this, we'll use a very simple criterion. Suppose that G and H are in H1 cap H2. 
then we know that g h to the negative 1, by definition, is an h1 cap h2. Because g h to the negative 1 is an h1 and g h to the negative 1 is an h2, since g and h are in both h1 and h2. Which shows that g h to the negative 1 is an h1 and a cap h2, and e is in both of them, so by definition, they are both subgroups. The intersection is a subgroup. Um, so, uh, the center and centralizer, those are kind of useful. Um, hmm. 46 is, um, it's wrong. For example, think of, yeah. so for example, let the set 0, 1, let h1, or h equal 0, 1. 0, 0, and k equal 1, 0, 0, 0, and let both these be subset of, be a subset of z2 times z2. Well, h union of k has both 0, 1, or h1 um, union h k has 0, 1, and 1, 0, but it does not have 1, 1, which implies that h union k is not a subgroup. All right. Uh, okay. I'm sure we're not trivial. Uh, subgroup is infinite. Well, that would just be the integers. A and B of the elements group. If a fourth B equals B A and a cubed equals E, prove that a B equals B A. There's the general theorem. Remove uh, for f of G must be abelian. Disprove um, every proper subgroup of a non-abelian group is a non-abelian. Should be a subgroup. G and C is a subgroup. Cool centralizer. Also a subgroup. Okay, for this, I'm not going to do the rest of these because they're very useful. They're very strong, but a, I'm tired. I've been streaming for about three hours, three and a half hours, and two, we don't currently have enough of the context to understand just how valuable a lot of these ideas are. So I'm not going to like make them seem more valuable than they realize at first glance. They're all extremely valuable, especially once we get to like silo, uh, silo groups, and such. We'll see an immediate use for them, but for now, um, there is not that much. Also, trying to do certain things without Lagrange's theorem is no. So, <laughs> I will come back next time with... I'll try to have a proof next time, hopefully, of the, um, of the case where the group that has... Like, if a group has even order and it's a finite group, then it necessarily has an element whose square is equal to the identity, which means also we have a subgroup of order 2 in that. That's fundamentally what that's saying. But, anyways, anyways. Uh, before we go, uh, let's just... I'm just going to read through this. And I will let you, anyone who's interested, like, actually end up doing it, but... For now, okay. 3.6 additional exercise checking errors. 1. UPC symbols. Universal product... Oh, shoot. Okay, give me a sec. Alright, UPC symbols. Universal product code UPC symbols are found on most products in grocery and retail stores. The UPC is a 12-digit code identifying the manufacturer of a product and the product itself. Figure 3.32. So it's this code 050000300426. Um, the first 11 codes contain information about the product with the 12th digit used for error detection. If D1, D2, all the way to D12 is a valid UPC number, then 3 times D1 plus 1 times D2 plus 3 times D3 plus, I assume, 1 times D4 plus 3 times D11 plus 1 times D12 is equal uh, congruent to 0 mod 12. A. Show that the UPC number 0, 50000 
300426, which appears in figure 3 deal, is a valid UPC number. Um, this is literally all just computation and showing how the integers modulo n could be used to like do at first basic error detection. Um, so write a formula to calculate the check digit t12 and the UPC number. If you can try, try most transposition errors, that is a term of two genes to have an interchange. So the transposition error 0, 0, 0500300426 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, is not detected. On a transposition error that is detected, can you find a general rule for the types of transposition errors that can be detected? Um, what it will be, most likely, is it will be things that are transposed by um, the, like, because things are multiplied by either 3 or 1, it'll be an error when it's 1 it on multiplied by 3, or a 3 and a 1 are interchanged, or a 1 and a 3 are interchanged, but now when a 3 and a 3 or a 1 or a 1 are interchanged. Alright, uh, 2. It is often useful uh, to use an inner product notation for this type of error detection scheme. Hence, we will use the notation d1, d2, all the way to dk, times w1, w2, all the way to wk, is congruent to 0 mod n, to mean d1, w1, to plus d2, w2, plus on and on to dk, wk, is congruent to 0 mod n. Suppose that d1, d2, all the way to d sub k, times w1, w2, all the way to w sub k, is congruent to 0 mod n, is an error detection scheme for the k digit identification number d1, d2, all the way to d sub k, where 0 is less than or equal to di is less than n. Prove that all single digit errors are detected if and only if the greatest common divisor of w, y, and n equals 1, where 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to k. I'm not going to use that at the moment, but it is... It looks like a very spicy theorem. Um, three. Let w uh, d1 d2 all the way to dk times d1 w2 all the way to wk congruent to zero mod n be an error detection scheme for the k digit identification number d1 d2 all the way to dk, where zero is less than or equal to di is less than n. Prove that all transposition errors of two digits di and dj are detected if and only if the greatest common divisor of wi minus wj and n is equal to one for i and j between one and k. Four. ISBN codes. Every, co uh, every book has an international standard book number, ISBN code. This is a 10 digit code indicating the book's publisher and title. The 10th digit is a check digit satisfying D1, D2 all the way to D10 times 10, 9 all the way to 1 is congruent to 0 mod 11. One problem is that D10 might have, to do, uh, might have to be 10 to make the inner product 0. In this case, 11 digits would be needed to make the scheme work. Therefore, the character X is used for the 11th dig uh, digit. So ISBN 3540-960-35-X is a valid ISBN code. A. Is ISBN 0-534-915-00-0 a valid ISBN code? What about the other ISBN code? Does this method detect all single-digit errors? What about transposition errors? How many different ISBN codes are there? Um, and the other are just a lot of other programming things. Uh, I'll leave the suggested readings and references on. Um, especially, it looks like Burnside's paper goes into a lot of especially group actions, which you eventually learn a lot about. But for now, I will probably just leave this as it is. Um, next stream will be cyclic groups, which will be... I forget if this is a prefix, uh, preface to like Lagrange's theorem. Uh, Lagrange's theorem and a lot of the stuff. Lagrange's stuff, so let me... Go back to the table of contents. Oh gosh, this is laggy. Oh no. Oh no, okay, well. This thing is having a moment. Oh, it will be permutation groups after this. Um, but still, next we'll be on cyclic groups and on permutation groups, and then we'll be approaching cosets and Lagrange's theorem, which are some very good and very valuable results, which is also probably what I will be phrasing the language of the one problem I intend to resolve uh, over the end of stream. Yeah, I guess not much else to do, so. Um, so, I guess, yeah, I'll see ya. Thanks for tuning in, and have a wonderful
Tack.